All right. Let's see. Uh, we are in the book of Micah. I encourage you to take your Bibles and turn there. Um, Micah is a, a good, interesting book, isn't it? I don't know if you have read it, um, but uh, I sure have been challenged studying it this past week. I, I've, it's really been a joy. This week was an interesting week. It was a busy week. Every week so, uh, seems to be busier and busier as the previous one. And my wife says, Jake, we're, we're busy. We need to slow down. And I would say, yes, we'll slow down. We'll slow down. And I'm becoming, um, starting to realize that I think that's going to happen when Jesus calls us home, right? Busyness is just a reality of life. I know I, I choose to make myself busy, but I wouldn't know what to do if I wasn't busy. I'd go crazy. So it's a good thing. Um, I am glad each of you are here. Um, I think, you know, as I continue to watch what's going on in the world, I don't know when the Lord's coming back, but it sure seems like it's getting uh, closer. And all I know is it's closer today than it was yesterday. But as I talk to people and I hear the heartaches that people are going through, I cannot encourage you enough to really work to be a church that bears each other's burdens. I just think there's a lot of, of hurt. There's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of uh, just scary things um, going around. And I think we just need to be there uh, for each other. Uh, just be aware of those things. The uh, book of Micah is a very, very interesting book. And I just was trying to think, what is the best way to summarize it? As always, I, I use a couple of books primarily. I use a lot. I use uh, gotquestions.org. That helps me get a lot of information. But the, um, I use the Moody Handbook of Theology. I use Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. I don't agree with everything that Grudem says. Uh, specifically on the role of the Holy Spirit. I would not see eye to eye with him. Um, I would, I use some of MacArthur's stuff. Um, I use Talk Through the Bible as a great resource. Um, I can't remember who wrote it, but that's a resource I use a lot. I'm trying to get the big picture of a, bo uh, a book. I use Mark Deaver's book, uh, The Message Through the Old Testament, um, and that helps me a lot as well. So, Trying to put these together can uh, be very hard uh, just for me and, and because of different reasons. But uh, one of the guys says it very well. He says, quote, Micah prophesied during a, a period of intense social injustice in Judah. False prophets preached for riches, not for righteousness. Princes thrived on cruelty, violence, and corruption. Priests ministered more for greed than for God. Landlords stole from the poor and evicted widows. Judges lusted after bribes. Businessmen used deceitful scales and weights. Sin had infiltrated every segment of society, and a word from God was mandatory. Micah enumerates the sins of the nation, sins which will ultimately lead to destruction and captivity. But in the midst of the blackness, there is still hope. A divine deliverer will appear, and righteousness will prevail. Though justice is now trampled underfoot, it will one day triumph. Doesn't that sound like America to a certain degree, right? I mean, I, I listen to people talk, and they say, um, I, I was talking to, I can't think of her name. You know uh, Fritchman's uh, fruit stand down here? I don't remember her first name. But her husband's name is Ellis. Neat, neat, neat couple. And Ellis has cancer. And he was there. And I went up to him and I said, I'm praying for you. And it looked like it almost brought tears to his eyes. Every time I, we go by there, his wife comes up and gives us a big, huge hug. Darlene. And, huh? Darlene. Darlene, yes. Very, very nice lady. And we were talking and she said, I just can't believe the way of the world. And I said, well, the great thing is, if you know Christ, it, the Bible talks about it. The Bible talks about these things happening and all that's going on. And I said, and she was talking about the election. And I said, well, you can look at it one of two ways. And, and I, I knew where she was coming from. She's coming from the conservative side. And I said, well, uh, what would you do if I voted for uh, the, uh, who is it, Kamala? Kamala. And she was like, what? And I said, well, things have to get worse for Jesus to come back. 
so what if I just try to speed that process up? And she didn't get my humor. Uh, but we talked, we, we talked through it, and, and I told her, I said, look, we're okay. If you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, don't worry. And she said, I'm just fearful for my kids and my grandkids and raising them. And I said, I understand. I understand. And so, but I tell her, I'm praying for her. The world is messy, right? It is messy and it's getting worse. The author of Micah, his name means who is like Jehovah. But we see that in Micah chapter 1, verse 1. He says, the word of the Lord, which came to Micah of Mor uh, Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. It's interesting that Micah's hometown of Moresheth Gath, chapter 1, verse 14, was located about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem on the border of Judah and Philistia near Gath. Similar to Amos, Micah was from the country. His family and occupation are unknown. But this area was a productive agricultural belt. Micah was not as aware of the political situation as Isaiah or Daniel was, but he showed a profound concern for the sufferings of the people. His clear sense of prophetic calling is seen in chapter 3, where it says, But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. Micah lived in the southern kingdom, it was written during the reign of Jotham and Hezekiah, who were good kings, who helped the nation. But then Ahaz came to the, uh, be king, and he was the wicked man who sold the nation into idolatry. It was probably written about 725, or it took place around 725 B.C., which is about three years prior to the destruction of Israel, right? Three years prior. I can give you the dates for the different kings if you want them for Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. It's interesting because Micah deals primarily with Judah, but he also addresses the northern kingdom of Israel and predicts the fall of Samaria in chapter 1, verse 6. Just fascinating. Micah's prophecy ranged probably from about 735 to 710 B.C. He was a contemporary of, when Hosea, uh, of Hosea in the northern kingdom and of Isaiah in the court of Jerusalem. It was interesting because his prophetic message included both the northern and southern kingdoms. We know that from chapter 1, verse 1, where it says concerning Samaria and Jerusalem, these are the two capitals of both the northern and southern kingdoms. His ministry focused primarily on the southern kingdom. The, the, the theme of Micah would be, in my mind, God's justice versus Judah's injustice. Or you could say God's faithfulness or God's loyalty versus the nation's disloyalty. Any of those would work. I think a key word in the book would be judgment, 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 judgment. And then towards the end of the book, you see the hope about the restoration. And I think as I read the book of Micah, it brings such encouragement to me. Because don't you despise the wickedness in our world? I mean, we're not in a, in a big city. We're not. But it, it drives me crazy when I try to go on a short little walk and I walk by a church that has a pride flag on their board. That just infuriates me. Because how could you, how dare you do such a foolish thing to my God? It just ooh, bugs me. 
And, I, and it's just like, Lord, take care of those people. But they need Christ. They need Christ. Micah 6, 8 would be a key verse. And, and John had to step out. I, I, I'm assuming he planned to do that song tonight where he says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. There's one other verse that many people would suggest is a key verse, and it would be chapter 7, verse 18, where it says, Who is a God like you, who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. You know, towards the end of the book, in chapters 6 and 7, uh, we would say, we might say those are the, the key chapters. One commentator says, quote, the closing section of Micah describes a courtroom scene. God has a controversy against his people. And he calls the mountains and hills together to form the jury. As he sets forth his case, the people have replaced heartfelt worship with empty ritual, thinking that this is all God demands. They have divorced God's standards of justice from their daily dealings in order to cover their unscrupulous practices. They have failed to realize what the Lord requires of them. There can only be one verdict, guilty. He goes on and says, nevertheless, the book closes on a note of hope. The same God who executes judgment also delights to extend mercy. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. No wonder the prophet exclaims, Therefore I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Chapter 7, verse 7. There's about a, there's 105 verses in the book. There's 2,138 words. About one-third of the entire book expresses the sins of his countrymen. Another third pictures the punishment God is about to send. And the final third holds out the hope of restoration once the discipline ends. I just thought this was interesting that you have a picture of Christ in the book of Micah, in Micah chapter 5, in chapter 5, verse 2, listen to what it says. He says, but as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, to, huh? Ephrathah. Ephrathah, thank you. Too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. This is one of the clearest and most important of all Old Testament prophecies, is that passage. Chapter 5, verse 2. The prophecy is about the birthplace and eternity of the Messiah that was made 700 years prior to his birth. The chief priests and scribes paraphrased this verse in Matthew chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, when questioned about the birthplace of the Messiah. Micah offers some of the best Old Testament descriptions of the righteous reign of Christ over the entire world in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, chapter 4, 1 to 8, and chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. And as we look to the book of uh, Micah this evening, I, I want us to, to see three things. Number one, God's justice poured out on sinners. Number two, God's mercy poured out on sinners. And number three, God's character known to sinners. And the question that I continue to ask myself is this, how am I living in light of God's justice amongst a wicked and perverse generation? Right? I'm not very good with patience. I don't know about you. Patience is not my strong suit. I, I want to be at two services already because we have that many people. 
I'm ready to add a third service on a Saturday night. I have a whole plan. I have a whole plan on how I would do two services so that we don't ultimately end up having two churches, right? This is our older people, first service. This is our younger people, second service. I have a whole plan. And I'm just saying, God, would you please do it faster? Right? And I said, Lord, help me to be patient. Patient. You know, I, I would like God in his kindness to strike a few of the so-called health, wealth, and prosperity pastors off the face of the earth because they're not helping anybody, right? Just like when, when, when uh, I think it was Christ who called out the Pharisees, he says, it's like you're tying this around their neck. You're leading them to hell, right? You're killing these people because you're not giving them the gospel. It, it bugs me that people are so deceived by this seeker-sensitive message because they're going to be shocked when they end up in hell. And there's no turning back. So let's quickly talk about number one, God's justice poured out on sinners. Well, the first couple of verses in Micah, uh, I have it up on the screen. It says here, O peoples, all of you listen, O earth and all it contains, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple, for behold, the Lord is coming forth from his palace. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth earth. Micah is prophesying about the future events that are coming. He's talking about the intensity of God's judgment, right? This is going to be intense. He says not just one part. He says, oh, earth and all it contains. This is going to be well known. The end of verse two, the Lord God will be witness against you. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's hard enough to, to have your spouse be brutally honest about you, right? And about your, your corks or whatever it may be. But can you picture a courtroom, the, the setting that, that God is our witness, whose eyes move to and fro and it sees all that we do? To my knowledge, it's never a good thing to hear that the Lord is against you. Verse 3 says, the Lord is coming down. The Lord is bringing his case against Samaria and Jerusalem. This is where the rubber meets the road. God says, enough is enough. I will deal with it. I didn't even get to to verse 4. I didn't know I didn't put it up there. But chapter 1, if you look at chapter 1, verse 4, he says, the mountains will melt under him and the valleys will be split like wax before the fire, like water poured down a steep place. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's like, that's like, you know, I, I think of somebody, a big guy walking and when he steps, the ground cracks, right? I mean, everybody's knowing that God is here. Why is God, why is God's justice being poured out on them? What have they done wrong? Well, in verse 5, he, he really tells us, he says there, all this is for the rebellion of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the rebellion of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? If you drop down to verse 9, he says, For her wound is incurable, for it has come to Judah. It has reached the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. This is how serious their sin is, right? They can't hide it from God. The eyes of the Lord, I think it's Proverbs 15, 3, see, move to and fro, and it sees all that we do. In chapter 1, verse 13, he says, Harness the chariot to the team of horses, O inhabitant of Lachish. She was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, 
because in you were found the rebellious acts of Israel. This is why. It's because of their rebellion. He goes on in, in chapter 2 explaining the case that he has against them. In chapter 2, verse 2, it says, They covet fields and then seize them, and houses, and take them away. They rob a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. My, Micah 3, 1 to 5, he expounds and he says, And I said, Hear now, heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear off their skin from them and their flesh from their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, strip off their skin from them, break their bones and chop them up as for the pot and as meat in a kettle. Verse 4, then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face from them. At that time, because they have practiced evil deeds, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. When they have something to bite with their teeth, they cry peace. But against him who puts nothing in their mouths, they, de they declare holy war. This is what's coming. It's because of their rebellion. It's because of their wickedness and their forsaking God. How is God's justice going to be poured out on the people or on the nation? Well, in chapter 1, verse 6, he says, For I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the open country, planting places for a vineyard. I will pour her stones down into the valley, and I will lay bare her foundations. He says, I'm going to utterly wipe you out. Verse 6, it, he, it says, All of her idols will be smashed. All of her earrings will be burned with fire, and all of her images I will make desolate, for she collected them from a harlot's earrings. And to the, no, not earrings, earnings. I'm sorry, what did I say? All of, sorry, let's go back to verse 7. See, I'm tired, you all notice that? All of her idols will be smashed. All of her earnings will be burned with fire. And all of her images I will make desolate, for she collected them from a harlot's earnings and to the earnings of a harlot they will return they're going to be burned with fire they're going to be made desolate micah 2 3 to 7 and, and for the sake of time i won't read all of those verses but it talks about there is going to be utter destruction god is going to win god is going to pour out his wrath in Micah 3, 4, it says it this way, Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face from them at that time because they have practiced evil deeds. God is serious about sin. As I was, as I was thinking about how can I apply this to my life, it, it made me think of this question. How am I responding to my sin? Isn't it easy to say, oh man, I'm doing good. My sin's not as bad as that. It's easy to justify our sin. If you're married, it's easy to excuse our sin, right? I'm not a morning person or I'm not a night person. I have a, I know a guy that, that told me that he and his wife have an agreement that any, anything said after 8 o'clock, they're not responsible for. Hmm. Maybe, I don't know. I thought about saying that anything after 8 p.m. and like noon, I'm not responsible for. Maybe I'd do better, Right? But that's not the case, right? How do we deal with our own sin? Your sin and my sin is the sin that put Jesus on the cross for you and me. 
God's mercy poured out on the sinners. This is how amazing God is, right? The, the nations are really, really bad, right? They're, they're making false gods. They're worshiping idols. They're doing all of these things. And look at Micah chapter 4, verse 1. It says, And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Verse 3, And he will judge between many people and render decisions for mighty, distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. He goes on in verse 5. It says, Though all the peoples walk each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather the outcasts, even those whom I have afflicted. God's justice has been poured out on the nation. And now God shows his mercy on these dirty, rotten sinners. Wow. I'm so grateful for God's mercy, aren't you? I mean, I'm grateful for God's forgiveness. Because he didn't just forgive me of my past and my present sins, but he forgives us of our future sins. Right? <coughs> There's a promise of Psalm 103 that when we confess our sins, he'll cast them as far as the east is from the west. God's mercy is amazing. You know, as I was thinking about this thought this past week, I, I asked myself this question, am I taking advantage of God's mercy? Isn't it easy to do? Or God's mercy or even God's forgive, forgiveness, right? Right? Oh, God will forgive me. Oh, God will forgive me. Oh, God will forgive me. I'll just ask God to forgive me. I, I think about, and I won't name any of my children, but I think about kids. And I think of myself at times. Have you ever sinned and you ask God to forgive you and you ask that person whom you sinned against to forgive you and less than an hour you do the very same thing to the exact same person and you ask that exact same person to forgive you and you ask God to forgive you too. And sometimes it's easy for that to become a habit in our lives. And so I think as we think about the mercy of God, it's a two-edged sword, right? We need to be thankful for God's mercy, but we need to take our sin seriously and not abuse it. God's character is known throughout the last two chapters a lot. Really, it's, it's two aspects of God's character. And I would say, number one, it would be his supremacy, that he is over, he is above all. In chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Hear now what the Lord is saying. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Listen, you mountains, to the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a case against his people, even with Israel he will dispute. My people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Answer me. Verse 4, Indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and ransomed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. My people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled and what Balaam son of Beor answered him and from I don't know is it Shedom to Gilgal so that you might know the righteous acts of the Lord with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high shall I come to him with burnt offerings with uh, 
yearling calves? Verse 7. Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? This is his supremacy, right? He is over all of these things. And then you get into chapter 7, verses 7 to 9, and it really shows us the graciousness of God. The graciousness of God. Where he says in chapter 7, verse 7, But as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. He says in verse 9, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring me out to the light and I will see his righteousness. God is a good God, isn't he? God is a gracious God. You know, it made me think of another question. Am I allowing the character of God to permeate my thoughts? That God is a, a God that is above all. That God is a gracious God. Oftentimes I let these, these things get out of my mind because I'm like, God, the world is so wrecked. The world is so messed up. People are crazy. People are crazy. I think it was last weekend on Monday night, maybe it was Monday, Sunday or Monday night, we were home at 9.30, we looked out and there were kids running around the park with guns like this, right here, right here. And I think they were airsoft guns, but they were like, it was crazy. And, and I, I can't remember, I, I was just talking to somebody else. Oh, um, I was reading an article earlier, or yes, yesterday maybe, I was reading an article, you remember that boy that was shot in the head? That, that young boy, well, they found the guy that shot him, and they let him go with the misdemeanor. Talk about people being mad. It's actually said that that guy that shot him in the head looked and laid the gun down and stepped over his body and ran off. And they say that that's okay. Okay. And it's so easy for me to lose sight of who God is that God will deal with the wretchedness of our world, right? And it's easy for me to get sidetracked and caught up in all of the, the ugliness and not say, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be here. Help me to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ because that's why we're here. What does this mean for you and I? Well, as I was thinking through this, I, I, I have been challenged to reflect on the character of God. Reflect on God's justice, God's mercy, God's supremacy, God's graciousness. Because we live in a wicked world, right? We have friends, family, whatever, where just heartbreaking things are happening. But friend, God is on his throne. God is in complete control. I will end with this one quote. I didn't know where to put it, but I just found it interesting. He says, quote, In some ways, Micah is an Isaiah in miniature. Both prophets addressed the same people and problems. You could compare... Micah chapter 1 verse 2 to Isaiah chapter 1 verse 2. You could compare Micah chapter 1 verses 9 and following to Isaiah chapter 10, 28 to 32. Micah chapter, and I can give these to y'all later if you want. It's just fascinating. There's lots of them. But see, Micah focused on the moral and social problems. While Isaiah placed greater stress on world affairs and political concerns. But there's a lot of similarities, and I can send you these passages. It was just pretty eye-opening for me. And so if you're here and you don't know Christ, or listening online and you don't know Christ, I, I just can challenge you that now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. If you don't know Christ, you need to deal with your eternal destiny before you go to sleep tonight. 
That was about two months ago, maybe three months ago. I had a guy that was a, a friend of mine. I wanted to be like him. He was involved in um, children ministry uh, at schools and, and four-day clubs and such. And, and he, would, uh, he just loved kids through and through and through. His name was Andrew. I think he has six kids, and he went to bed, and he had to be, in his, I think, in his 30s, maybe, maybe a little older. He went to sleep, and he never woke up. He had a massive heart attack, and God took him home. And so if you don't know Christ, I would encourage you to get right with Christ right here, right now. But on the other side of that, I, I did a, a memorial service this past week for a lady who was, I think, had some health problems, but she had a heart attack and didn't wake up. And her family was devastated. And the challenge for me was that we value our friendships and our relationships, our families, those whom we love, because the enemy is working hard to cause disunity within his church and the other ministries of the church. And I think we need to be aware of that and we need to remember that the people you're sitting next to, behind, or in front of may not be here tomorrow. And we need to make the most of every opportunity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. I pray, Father, that we would continue to be faithful. Lord, it's, it, sometimes it's hard because when we get our eyes off of Christ, we can focus on our circumstances and our failing health or the problems in our life, and we get discouraged and then we don't want to do anything because you're not working things out the way that we feel that they should be. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to change our focus. Lord, help us as your children to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Father, help us to be faithful, to live out the gospel. Lord, help us to be faithful to maximize every divine opportunity you give us. And Lord, help us to meditate on the character of our God, that you are a just God, that you are a God that is above all, you are a God that's in control of all things, you are a God of mercy. And Lord, may we always have our eyes fixed on the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endure the cross. We thank you for your faithfulness and kindness in Christ, and we pray, amen.